Hello and welcome to all of you to the um, Bayuk event, uh, Consumer Credit 2.0, Consumer P Proof Loans in Digital Times. Um, this is a fantastic panel we have for you today um, with, uh, with people from the European Commission, from the European Parliament, uh, from consumer groups and from the financial industry to talk us through some of the changes um, that are in the wings on the EU's laws on consumer credit. Um, so the EU has had uh, a consumer credit directive regulating personal loans that aren't mortgages since 2008, uh, but the Commission has proposed to overhaul it in June. Um, they say they want to avoid excessive over-indebtedness. They say they want to adapt to the use of digital devices and digital sales channels, um, and they want to improve how, um, how borrowers' credit worthiness is assessed to make sure that people who take out a loan can afford to repay it. Um, as always with commission proposals, it's now on its way through the European Parliament and Council, so anything could happen. Um, and we have a panel, uh, a panel today who hopefully can tell us some of the things that might happen to it or that they hope will happen to it. Um, uh, just some housekeeping, we're being recorded today um, and the final video of the event will be uh, made available on the Bayek YouTube channel um, shortly afterwards. Um, if you have any questions, we are, we're going to have a series of opening interventions from our speakers, um, followed by a panel discussion. Um, but I also hope that uh, you'll be sending in your questions, which you can do using the Q&A tab at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Um, so if you already have a question to ask, please feel free to send it in now. Or if you'd rather wait, we'll pick those up um, when we go to the Q&A. So I'm not going to um, speak for much longer because no one's come to hear me. Um, uh, my name is Jack Schickler from MLEX, by the way, uh, um, um, but I'm going to turn to our, our, our important speakers now, um, starting with um, the European Commission's um, Acting Deputy Director General at DG Justice, which is responsible for the proposal that came out in June, um, Niels Berndt, who's going to talk us through um, some of the features of the proposal um, that was launched. Niels. Thanks a lot, Jack. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to join you this morning to, to discuss um, the very important proposal on consumer credits. Um, the financial situation of consumers is, is very important. It's the basis for, for how they can organize their lives. And this financial situation has come under pressure. It's delicate in any uh, time. Some consumers are quite well off, others are less well off. But uh, the, the corona pandemic has put increasing pressure on the financial situation of consumers. And now also the rising energy prices, the rising inflation is putting additional pressure on consumers throughout the union. That's why the uh, issue of, of um, looking into the financial situation of consumers and protecting them, giving them the right tools in terms of having access to credit, to consumer credits is a very important topic. In this context, um, we have a consumer credit directive of the year 2008, which um, overall served two purposes. What, first, obviously, to, to ensure a high level of consumer protection with regard to consumer credit. And second, also very important, to um, have the single market as a basis for economic operators um, in Europe. Uh, we can stay for the, the, let's say, on the first slide for the time being, not for the scope yet. And so um, protecting consumers, but also having the single market really as a single market for consumer credits, something which up to now did not deliver well, very well. Before coming with the proposal uh, this year, we did a very thorough evaluation of the 2008 directive. And we realized that overall, the directive succeeded quite well to ensure a high level of consumer protection. This high level of consumer protection has been put um, in challenge by the ongoing digitalization of the market. So consumers are looking for information and taking credits now much more online uh, than they did in the past. Also, the um, actors are more diverse. While we had, uh, let's say, just the traditional uh, credit providers in the past, we now have new uh, actors entering the market and we have new products. Um, short-term high-risk loans, loans which are, let's say, uh, pushed to consumers in the online market. And of course, then uh, during the pandemic crisis, we also saw that where we have extraordinary circumstances, the directive only provides a very loose framework for ensuring uh, consumer protection, and their member states had to take quite a lot of measures beyond the directive themselves. 
the, the, the second objective of ensuring a single market on consumer credits, uh, as our evaluation showed, has not really evolved um, in the past. We have a very low level of uh, cross-border provision of consumer credits for all kinds of reasons uh, that uh, often the, the financial credit providers rather prefer to operate than with subsidiaries in the different member states than directly across border. Languages, of course, uh, play a role. Different regulatory regimes play a role. So the, the um, cross-border provision of consumer credits is at, at a very low level. But we still believe we should maintain this perspective. We should not abandon the idea of having the, the single market uh, also allowing providers of consumer credits to operate uh, across the border in the interest of consumers and in the interest of the economic operators. And in any case, with the digitalization and um, the, the developments in the online market with big tech platforms, et cetera, that could move into the area of, of consumer credits, we believe we need to preserve this framework. So that's the, the um, starting point from which we started. And now let me take you through the six major areas of the commission proposal. First, regarding the scope. Next slide, please. Um, regarding the scope, we believe that it's very important to extend the scope of the current directive. Current directive um, excludes a couple of, of credit forms, such as free interest uh, credits, leasing agreements, overdrafts are excluded. The credit uh, directive only applies for credits as of 200 euro and only up to 75,000 euro and it does not apply at the moment to crowdfunding credit services. We believe we have to extend the scope of the credit directive in all four areas. First, we believe it's important to also cover um, credit forms such as free interest rate credits. Why? Because very often, even if it may um, be free of interest at the very beginning, there can be significant costs for the consumers if something goes wrong with this uh, free credit. So uh, imagine you buy uh, let's say a product online, uh, no interest rate to be paid, but then you're buying too many products and suddenly you can't pay the, the interest rates and suddenly the costs for serving those small credits become quite important. Therefore, we believe important to cover this. Also, the lower threshold in our view is outdated. Why? Again, because it's not just the one single consumer credit that puts the consumer into difficult situations. It can be the accumulation of different small credits Anyway, a couple of member states already applied the directive below the threshold of 200 euro. We propose to simply delete it. The upper threshold overall in our view makes sense, should be maintained, but should be updated in light of the inflation. And then we have this new area of crowdfunding credit service, an important area which gives consumers access to, to additional credit sources. And it's also a very important tool um, for, for uh, those who want to provide um, uh, financing to certain projects uh, uh, via crowdfunding uh, tools. So we believe crowdfunding credit services are important. At the moment, however, um, the uh, situation where consumers are taking credits out of crowdfunding platforms is not covered at all by any European legislation, not by the crowdfunding regulation, which uh, deals with business to business, nor by the consumer credit directive. And that's why we believe we should use this opportunity to at least uh, set out rules for the consumers that are taking out credit from those crowdfunding platforms. Second important area, and that brings us to the next slide, is the information disclosure. Up to now, the rules um, we have at union level is really geared at ensuring that the consumer who sits in a bank gets the paper form uh, put in front of her or him, is then having the necessary information on this um, uh, so-called SECI form, which we have developed at a union level. For the paper credits, that's working quite well. But we see that nowadays uh, consumers are informing themselves more and more online. And really, uh, if you want to, to get the relevant information from the SECI on your smartphone screen, you might have to swipe up to 30 times. And we know how consumers are even checking the, the, the detailed print on the cookies, which they have to accept left and right. 30 swipes, nobody will do. So we simply have to make sure that the way we are passing the relevant information to consumers online and also in, in um, advertisements such as radio or television are more effective at passing the right information. To get there, we um, want to stipulate some, some basic um, uh, obligations, such as to make sure that information is always clearly legible 
and adapted to the medium of the information, that we are reducing the amount of information in advertisements. We are also foreseeing to add on top of the, let's say, full-blown information uh, format, also an overview, which just resumes the key information so that the consumer at the very beginning has an idea about the costs, um, which could come up over credit, the time, uh, the withdrawal, etc. We also want to clarify better um, when consumers should get the information. At the moment, the directive says in good time, which is very vague and leaves a lot of margin. We, we, we believe we should be more precise. And as a matter of um, principle, we believe the consumer should get the information at least one day before the product, uh, contract is signed. There may be situations, the, the, the immediate contracts where somebody really needs to, to take a contract uh, even faster. In that case, we propose to remind the consumer then once the, she or he has concluded the, the contract to remind her or him about the right of withdrawal uh, so that uh, if um, he, she or he doesn't have the time of one day to reflect about the contract, uh, really there is a reminder of this right of withdrawal. And then we want to align the, the directive with some improvements uh, on consumer information that were agreed in the meantime by the co-legislator on the mortgage credit directive and on the non-performing loans. So just to make sure that the framework on consumer information in the different areas is fully aligned. Next slide, please. Then the, the very important uh, third point uh, that we address is the, the exploitation of consumer situation and behavior. Um, we have more and more use of data about the personal situation of consumers that is used in, in the market. They can be positive for consumers because they're getting targeted information and offers, but it also can be risky because it can push consumers into certain uh, decisions which they may not want to take, uh, let's say, if they had the time to really reflect upon it. In that regard, we, we foresee a couple of proposals. Um, first, we want to, to um, oblige um, those traders that are, um, um, let's say, using personalized offers based on automated processing, that this is clearly identified that the consumers know whether they get a standard offer or whether they get a personalized offer. Then in line with, um, uh, again, recent improvements of the mortgage credit directive, uh, we uh, try to align the rules in, in the consumer credit area, also on obligations on conduct of business, on knowledge and competence uh, requirements for the staff, on advisory services, uh, also um, uh, on ban of tying of consumer credits to other financial products, again, in line with the mortgage credit directive. We want to ban the use of pre-tick boxes, something which we know from other areas. It's already part of the consumer credit directive, should also be part in our view of the consumer credit directive. Um, we then are also proposing, and that's part of the response um, also to Corona, but uh, beyond, uh, we propose to put a cap on interest rates. At the moment, we don't have any maximum cap at the union level. And that has led to situations uh, in extreme cases where um, the consumer had to pay um, interest rates of 1,500%. Um, of course, that is a small credit, but again, the problem often does not come from one single big credit, it's the agglomeration of small credits. A couple of member states already have um, an interest rate cap, and we believe um, there is a a good case now to, to oblige all member states to impose a cap on interest rates. However, we don't go that far to impose a European, um, a European cap because we believe the situation in member states is different. We just would oblige member states to impose a cap at national level. And then finally, we also foresee a ban on unsolicited uh, credit sales, something which is already part of the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, but we want to be specific also here. Next slide, please. A very important other area which needs to be improved is the credit worthiness assessment already foreseen in the current directive, but um, the rules are too vague, which is, let's say, uh, unclear for the economic operators, but also exposes consumers to, to risks at the current uh, stage. We want to, to um, uh, let's say, be more specific on what kind of um, 
uh, rules the operators have to um, follow when they're doing the creditworthiness assessment. For example, we want to specify that only information on financial and economic circumstances must be used. And that means, as we spell out in the recital of the proposal, that, for example, information on the health situation, so a previous cancer, uh, for example, must not be used in the assessment of the creditworthiness assessment. Then, very important second point is that um, we spell out that the credit in principle should be made available only if the creditworthiness assessment is positive. However, we allow for certain exceptions in well-specified and justified situations. Uh, imagine that the consumer who is already in over-indebtedness has to, to pay for an important uh, uh, health intervention which is not fully covered by the uh, national healthcare system or by the insurance. We believe in this kind of situation, there should be a possibility for the credit provider nonetheless to give the credit. Uh, but again, because it, it, let's say, is of course risky for the consumer, it therefore should be in very specified and justified circumstances. And last point, we, we um, uh, want to make sure that the consumer gets very clear explanations of the creditworthiness assessment, in particular, if any kind of automated processes has been used for the creditworthiness assessment. Next slide, please. Last point on the over indebtedness, very important point. Um, uh, we want to, to impose obligations on member states to promote financial education, which is critical uh, in this area. Uh, we also, and that's also part of the um, uh, response to the corona experience. We want to oblige member states to put out rules that uh, credit providers have to exercise reasonable forbearance before enforcing uh, proceedings against uh, uh, consumers that are not fully paying back their consumer credits. We are not specifying all the details because again, it's a part of the national judicial system, but overall as a principle, we believe that reasonable forbearance should be um, used in case of extraordinary circumstances. And then we also want to make sure that debt advice services are made available to consumers in all the member states at high quality, because really good debt advice is critical for consumers. And we want to make sure that all consumers get access to this debt advice. Last slide, please. Um, finally, on enforcement, uh, uh, again, we want to align the Consumer Credit Directive um, uh, with recent improvements in other areas, such as the Mortgage Credit Directive on um, specific um, competent authorities, which should be designated by the member states, and also with regard to powers of the national authorities in alignment in particular with the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive and the Unfair uh, Contract Terms Directive, where we propose that um, uh, national authorities should at least have the power uh, of maximum fines for widespread infringements of at least 4% of the traders' annual turnover. So those are the main uh, areas of the, the Commission proposal. Uh, thanks for your patience. Now, indeed, as the moderator already said, uh, the, the proposal is pending in Council and Parliament. We had already first uh, discussions, of course, in both institutions. We have also uh, Madame Latea Marcus there, so I leave uh, to her to, to explain on the Parliament position. But overall, I have to say we are very, let's say, uh, grateful for the overall positive reaction in both institutions, Council and Parliament. There is a great willingness to take this file forward fast. Of course, uh, we may be uh, able to, to improve it even further. Lots of stakeholders already contributed to the proposal. Now you're engaging with council and parliament, but let's say we are heartened that the proposal is taken forward very fast in both institutions, which might lead to already starting trial of discussion sometime uh, early next year. But that, of course, I leave to the parliament and to the council. And therefore, back to you. Thank you very much indeed. That was um, uh, an excellent introduction, um, as you'd expect. Um, there's clearly a lot going on in the context of COVID, in the context of the digital transformation. Um, so uh, interest rate caps, um, tackling consumer exploitation, better credit worthiness assessments, um, some pretty big fines uh, for those who get it wrong, um, and an extension of the scope of this directive that's been around for, for over a decade. Um, uh, I mean, now, now it's all down to the European Parliament, of course, and the Council. So I, 
I'd like to ask Maria Manuel uh, Leitao Marquez, um, who we are very honored to have joining us, um, who will be a shadow rapporteur on behalf of the Socialists and Democrats group, um, looking at this and pouring over this legislation and deciding how it could be improved. Um, and what, what changes are you going to be seeking to make, um, Maria Manuel? Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Monique, for the organization of this important debate. As usual, Bilk is always uh, helping us in our work. And uh, I also my compliments to the other members of the debate, and special to Deco from Portugal, uh, and also Sebastian and Oliver. So let me start by saying that there are many, uh, many improvements in this directive compared to the previous one, uh, in large scope, uh, more consumer rights, uh, such as banned and solicit credit sales, banned time practices, or banned pre-ticket boxes, to, uh, to, to, to refer to some of them. However, we must build on, on the on top of this proposal from the Commission, and I will give a quick overview of five changes I consider at the moment, uh, but we need to continue to discuss with different players and, of course, with the consumers' uh, representatives. First, one of the main state goals of this review was uh, an update to the digital era. I think we can do a better job in the Parliament. Let me refer four aspects. The proposal needs more consideration of the new credit products and the new players in the market, of course, in the digital market. Uh, uh, second, most of all, it must deal with a large amount of personal data floating around, which must not be used for profiling, advertising, or credit worthiness assessment. For instance, it would be advisable to state clearly what data should be used for credit worthiness assessment, Article 18, as European Data Protection recommends. Uh, sales through digital channels could also be clearly addressed here. The European Banking Authority has done a better job on this topic. And finally, also concerning digital, there is still a lot around the use of paper documents. I don't know why uh, that we had to update. Now you had, uh, you had uh, electronic identification. In Portugal, you have a very clear way to do that, how to use so, so paper, and uh, I don't understand. My second point um, referred to cap caps. We have to look into CAPS more closely as well, Article 31. It doesn't make sense to introduce CAPS on interest rates only, one of the options, as costs will be passed to consumers anyway. We need to look into ways for introducing CAPS on the total cost of the credit or annual percent rate of charge, but to do it in a way that does not distort the internal market. is definitely a challenge, but we can come up with a solution, I'm deeply convinced. My third point is about cross-border credit market. Well, I believe uh, new players and, of course, digital tools will take care of that, uh, either we like it or not. And thus, we must ensure they can do it adequately and within a framework that is safe for consumers. We need databases for credit worthiness assessments to be accessible in other member states and to have interoperability 
between different uh, data drivers uh, and perhaps some data standards, Article 19. Fourth, I believe we need to be clear on the exemptions in place for granting credit to someone that has been given a negative credit worthiness assessment, Article 18. I even doubt if that, if, if uh, we should, uh, or there is, there, there should be exemption. I, I'm not convinced about the argument of uh, the Commission, and I think um, uh, the way uh, the article uh, is written is too open and uh, is a problem. Credit worthiness assessments are fundamental tool for protection of both the consumers and business. Uh, and a negative assessment is a last defense against over indebtedness that we should not weaken. And uh, finally, let's remember that laws may be perfect on paper, but need to be effectively enforced. Um, in that sense, I will also be looking into supervision and enforcement. That is a very important point in order to fight the gap between law in books and law in action. In particular, it's important that supervisors, supervisors and well-staffed and equipped are well-staffed and equipped with relevant powers to enforce this directive both for traditional and newer digital players in the market. So Article 41, we need to think uh, uh, how it is right, it is written and probably makes some amendments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, between uh, digital issues, interest rate caps, credit worthiness assessment and, and effective enforcement, it sounds like you'll have your work get out for you. Uh, in, in carving out some amendments. Um, I'd now like to turn just to our representative from the industry, um, uh, Sebastian de Brauer from um, uh, the Chief Policy Officer at the European Banking Federation um, is here with us. Um, and, and when I asked the, the commissioners, Commissioner Reinders and Commissioner Jourova about this proposal when it first came out, um, they said they wanted to end debt tragedies, debt tragedies without disrupting markets. Um, yeah, I also notice uh, the, the Commission's own impact assessment says there's a 1.5 billion administrative costs for the banking sector in implementing these new rules. Um, do you think, uh, Sebastian, that the, the, the Commission has got the balance right here? Uh, Jack, thank you. Uh, thank you also to Monique to, um, I mean, for inviting us to, to participate to this important debate. Um, we praise very much the relationship we have with 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 Berk um, and, and a dialogue, the constant dialogue we have with uh, with you. Um, well, I'm, I may be a bit of a disruptive, um, you know, speaker today. Um, uh, well, as you mentioned, indeed, most of the cost will uh, indeed be borne by the uh, the credit providers. Uh, I've mentioned by the uh, by the Commission itself in, in its impact assessment. Um, in terms of adaptation of the infrastructure and, and, and personal costs. And that's not an issue uh, as such. By the way, I think an important part of the cost might be borne by um, non-bank lenders more than, uh, than bank lenders. Uh, that's the first comment and, and also, and I'm representing banks. Um, and, and, and the second comment is, of course, that well, as, as, as always, uh, most of those costs are at the end pass on to, to the customers. Um, so that means that we have indeed a, a joint or common interest to get this uh, directive uh, or those rules right. Uh, also because, and, and I like to mention that always, I don't like uh, you know, any opposition between banks and consumers on, 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 on responsible lending. I think it's the interest of banks themselves um, to make sure that, I mean, they lend uh, responsibly uh, because otherwise they have to deal with um, issues and NPLs, and, and, and that's, of course, very costly 
for them as well. Now, the question at the end is indeed whether um, the proposal will meet the, the objective set, which are indeed, well, to reinforce the, uh, the safety net for EU consumers on the one hand, and also to make sure that the um, regulatory framework is adapted to the new uh, digital uh, environment. Um, and I think there, at least we have some doubts that the text as it is now will meet entirely those objectives or adequately those objectives. And uh, let me take one, one example, um, and especially the, the, the the, 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 the digitalization uh, aspect, uh, which, is, which is very important for us banks, also in the competition, uh, fierce competition or increasing competition we face with uh, non-banks, including the fintechs and, and the big techs. Um, then, and I like what uh, Marie Emmanuel said there. I think we have, uh, in our view, to, to, do, to do more actually. Um, to make sure that the, the new real framework is indeed adapted to the, this new reality of, uh, of digitalization. Um, Maria Manuel mentioned, for instance, there is a lot of reference still on, 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 on paper or, or durable medium, um, which in our view is not always feasible uh, and, and practical in, in the digital world. So this is something we need to look at. Um, on, on advertising, uh, we believe there as well, the, the requirements uh, proposed are still the same as they were perhaps uh, a decade ago at the time of printed advertisement. There are new ways um, to um, inform uh, consumers about their, 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 uh, the necessary information they need. Uh, through reference to, to web page, etc., but not specifically to add all those um, components in um, the uh, directly in the advertisement uh, as such. Um, when we speak about pre-contractual information, uh, I think it's, this will be part of another another uh, subject in the debate. But uh, actually, uh, we consider that consumers are already suffering from information overload even more, I would say, in a digital uh, environment where we know that consumers most of the time do not read um, many, many of those information. And the perception is that we are adding on even more, um, you know, information uh, requirement, notably um, in the form of, of, of general information and the, this uh, single European consumer credit overview. So the, the SECO in addition to the to the to the to the seki. Um, so so all this makes us um, well I believe that we if if we do not uh, further uh, adjust or adapt um, the, the the directive will 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 miss um, you know an opportunity um, to to um, uh, adjust to um, to the new um, digital digital world. I, I will stop here. There are other issues um, that uh, I like to raise, but we'll have I think time during the debate. Uh, so I try to stick to the three four minutes you allowed me. Um. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for attempting that. And uh, just a reminder to all our other panelists, we do have an awful lot to get through and I hope we can turn to the audience as well. Um, so please um, try and keep your comments brief and, and we'll come back to many of these other topics during the debate. Um, I, I'd like to turn to Olivier Jerusalem uh, uh, now from Financial Inclusion Europe, which is a group that campaigns for those facing difficulties accessing and using financial services. Um, we've heard a lot from, from all our speakers actually about the credit, work, credit worthiness assessment, which determines whether a borrower can afford to repay. Um, how, how important is that for you in, in safeguarding consumers' rights? Well, uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much for, 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 for Berg for the invitation and, and for you, Jack, for this uh, important question uh, about credit worthiness assessment. Um, just to start, I want to mention that Financial Inclusion Europe on this file is really willing to guarantee a large access to credit for credit for worthy uh, households. So among our members, we, you, you have to know that we have practitioners in microfinance, microcredit, but also debt advisor, and also researcher on overdebtedness and on the credit industry. So for this reason, we know by experience that it is possible to achieve a paradoxal but effective double objective. So we can together 
increase the credit access to credit worthy households and also limit the risk of overindebtedness. To achieve these two goals, a proper credit for finance assessment is key. Um, so what credit for finance is about what? It's about first budget analysis. So the nature of the data used uh, should be, uh, sh should provide the truthful image of the household budget about its incomes, uh, expenditures, the ongoing credit and possible over debts arrears. For example, uh, in, in my past, in some past experience, uh, I was a credit officer in, my, in microfinance, and we used to uh, analyze the three last months of the bank statements to check these, if there is even a, a, a narrow uh, financial capacity to repay the, the credit that was envisaged. Uh, so that was the old, old way to do that, I would say, the old fashioned way to do that. And so uh, coming back to credit for finance assessment, it's about so the, the budget analysis, but it's also we'll see about the type of credit that is proposed and how it can fit or not the repayment capacity of the household. So uh, in reality, uh, credit for finance assessment relates to a certain level of monthly reimbursement. So it relates to the size, the terms, the condition to the, to the credit considered. So it's it's really, it's really a matter of matching a credit, uh, the, the cost related to that and the financial capacity of the customers. So credit for uh, finance assessment uh, should be based on the budget. And it's the only tool to allow something that is really interesting now is that it allows to telemate credit provision based on very precise and accurate bank statements and to operationalize like that in industrial size. So it's really a great innovation because we are passing from a kind of uh, uh, average uh, treatment of, uh, let's say, risk of default uh, assessment to a uh, fine-tuned, personalized, uh, let's say, budget analysis to allow, to allow a real um, credit for finance assessment to be done. So. Um, what is very interesting to, to observe also today is that new tools made these change absolutely feasible and already a reality because open banking and AI together uh, made, made possible this innovation for the benefit of the credit industry, but also for the benefit of the users, of course, and the one that are so far rejected from uh, the, 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 the way the credit risk assessment is made for, for, the, for the time being. On the nature of the data to be used, it is key for inclusion and to prevent against discrimination, but also uh, against issues related to consent, to access to consent, to follow the two central documents issued uh, respectively by first the EBA uh, in its uh, guideline on credit origination which provides the very precise list of the relevant data to be used for credit worthiness assessment. And on this point, we just recommend to simply integrate them in the consumer credit directive. And the other document is the one issued by the EU data protection supervisor opinion paper on the CCD, which precisely also insists on the need to describe the data to be used for credit for finesse and to be exclusively, exclusively used for credit for finesse and the one to be used for marketing purpose. It's key in digital area to, to really define all these, uh, let's say, perimeters. Um, I would like also just to finish uh, to say a, a last word about the large coalition of NGOs that um, will engage to follow this, this file uh, with really an, um, a very high attention and I would like just to, to mention that not only Berg Deco and also financial inclusion together with 11 other uh, major actors in the field are engaged and start to communicate on this coalition today. So uh, we're very happy to, to, to push for this change. Thank you. Thank you. And we're very happy to hear about that. Obviously the importance of limiting the data used is a, is a central feature of this legislation that I think, I think we'll come on to um, in, the, in the digital context. Um, uh, Vinay, um, uh, I'd like to ask you a question as well, because 
um, Portugal is, is one of the countries that ha already has imposed one of these interest rate caps that, that Niels has proposed spreading to every single member state. Um, and I understand some of that interest rate cap is in particular looking at green loans. Um, uh, so what impact has that had in your country that, that perhaps the rest of Europe could learn from? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack, for this very interesting question. And of course, thank you uh, to Bill and to Monique uh, for this uh, event and for inviting us uh, to present the Portuguese case. And also a special uh, hello to Maria Manolo to Marx. Uh, how are you? Um, regarding the, the Portuguese approach on the capping, it's not on interest rates. It's very interesting to, to go to, to the definition. It's on the APRs. And that is something that has already been said by uh, Ms. Maria Manolitan, Marx, that it cannot be on interest rates. It should be on the APRC, which is the actual cost of the, the loan itself. So it reflects the weight of not only the interest rate, which is the cost of money, but also the, the other costs, charges and fees uh, by, 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 the, by the provider, and eventually even other uh, uh, products which are associated to the loan. So in the end, that is the actual cost for having access to that product. So in our view, that the, the cap uh, that has to be defi defined should be on the APRC. Um, this has been introduced in Portugal when the, when, it, when the previous version of the CCD was transposed back in 2009. Um, and the model is, has been adapted uh, since. Uh, so the initial model had a couple of flaws, which was then uh, corrected. And basically uh, every three months, the Bank of Portugal calculates the, the market developments uh, of the rates applied, uh, then uh, introduces a formula, which is basically maths, uh, but it, it actually deviates uh, potential uh, ways that the market could influence um, the, the cap for the next trimester. So that is uh, avoided. So it basically reflects a very good, uh, in a very good way, what the market is doing and also the, the conditions surrounding the, the provision of the, the, the loans. Um, this, this, as I said, this is a trimesterally done. Uh, every three months, the Bank of Portugal issues the caps for the next three months. Uh, so for every quarter. Um, and this is divided di to different types of loans. So there are loans for a regular consumer loan, where there is no specific uh, destination for the, the funds uh, needed to disclose. Then there are car loans, which are separate into different four different categories. Uh, there are loans for um, health uh, um, expenses, loans for um, environmental improvements of the household, uh, and uh, also for education purpose. Uh, there are loans the overraft, there are um, uh, credit cards. So there are six or seven different uh, categories. Uh, and there are different levels of caps according to these categories. Uh, regarding the question you made about green loans, this, there is only a specific type of loans regarding environmental or energy, energy efficient uh, equipment, which, has been, uh, which could be um, uh, acquired for your house. Let's say, for example, you want to install solar panels uh, for the use of solar energy in, in, in warming uh, water for the use in, in the house. So you could apply um, uh, through this uh, category of personal loans uh, and have access to a lower cap on APRs for this specific type of loans comparing, for example, with a regular consumer loan. So th this is, in our view, a very good uh, measure. Um, and um, regarding the impact that it has, generically, the impact of setting caps on APRs has disciplined the Portuguese market. It actually basically ran out uh, those uh, who were somewhat uh, using predatory lending uh, back in 2009, 2010, 2011, and then gradually since the application of these caps, they actually came out, either closed their business or adapted to the caps that are now imposed. Um, we have a, a, low, a lowering curve of the caps in most, mostly all types of credits um, in these, uh, um, in this, uh, under the CCD. Um, regarding the, 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 the current uh, APRs, let's uh, just, just give you a flavor of what is, uh, what is actually um, in, we're talking about in terms of uh, maximum APRs. For the fourth quarter of 2021, um, personal loans uh, generically 
would be 12.9% APR. Um, for example, credit cards, the maximum would be 15.6 APR. And then for the personal loans, for, for example, uh, re renewable energy loans, that cap is 6.2%. So we can see that it is a very disciplined market. There are reasonable uh, rates that should be applied, and not only rates, sorry, the cost of the loans, um, which allows the Portuguese consumers who, again, follow creditworthiness assessments and are uh, approved, to have access to um, considerably well-defined um, costs for that loan. Um, so yeah, I would stop there. Thank you very much. Um, Monique, uh, you know, there's obviously been a big rise in, in payday lending, in, in buy now, pay later initiatives like, like Klarna, um, which could have consequences for the rights of consumers and the interests of consumers. Uh, do you feel this proposal has addressed those well enough? Oh, well, thank you for the question, Jack, and good morning to all of you. Before answering your question, I just would like to, to make uh, two uh, comments to what uh, I heard from the previous speakers, because I cannot resist making those comments, and I have the privilege of more or less hosting this week together with you. Uh, first of all, concerning the green loans, I think, I really think it would be a unique opportunity for the Commission to contribute to getting people into the green transition by allowing them to invest into energy efficiency, by giving a signal to the financial market, you need to support green loans. So it would be, it's of course another type of obligation, but it would be really a positive signal for people so that they can afford, that, that they can contribute. Uh, they need other uh, help, huh? uh, but also the funding. That's very important. And the second point I would like to make is about credit worthiness and what Olivier mentioned. There is for the moment, we are in an era of data bulimia, uh, data inflation. And what we see is that more data do, does not mean better credit worthiness assessments. So in this context, slim is beautiful. And that's why just take a limited list of financially re relevant data on which you base the credit worthiness assessment. The rest is pollution and, and makes it even more difficult to have a really uh, worthy, uh, worthy credit worthiness assessment. So uh, that was something I could really, I really would to put across the, 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 the panel this morning. Now, coming back to your question and being back to discipline, uh, yes, indeed, small credits such as uh, payday loans or buy now, pay later schemes, uh, they, they exist in several years, of course, but they have been very popular uh, during, uh, since the pandemic because consumers have been more online. And that's where the, this type of offers is very popular. And also because less affluent consumers who have lost their income, who have lost their job during the pandemic, well, they, they were not able to really cover their daily expenses uh, for essential needs otherwise than with those type of loans. Uh, and we see these developments with very great concerns because those products are nudging. Well, I would even say sludging, which is the abusive way of nudging people into a certain uh, behavior, uh, into a credit that is not necessarily, uh, that they cannot afford or that they do not really need, uh, and that come with high cost. When you look at payday loans, well, we have already mentioned, and in the, in the chat you will see quite uh, impressive and concerning figures, they come very often with excessive, uh, excessive interest rates, uh, sometimes several thousands of, of percent. And by now, uh, pay later products really, you know, exploit uh, this um, impulse uh, purchases uh, behavior that consumers can have. And they also include many hidden costs uh, that uh, in, 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 in case of, uh, of late payments and consumers are not aware of that. They are only a few clicks away from being in a very toxic uh, credit relationship. And uh, our uh, member in the UK, Citizen Advice, has made a survey that found that one in four customers have regretted to have used uh, buy now, pay later schemes, and one in two had difficulties in repayment. So that's quite uh, uh, um, uh, an impressive figure. And that means that for us, of course, it's a major improvement that the Commission proposal expands the scope uh, of the, of the, the revised uh, directive so that those um, small loans, uh, small but uh, not beautiful, um, they need, those providers also will need to make uh, credit worthiness assessments uh, to start with. So that's something that is very important. And our, we already hear now calls for a lighter regime. It's only small loans. But what we really would like to really get very clearly across, 
what seems to be a small loan uh, for a creditor can be a step into over indebtedness for a consumer who is living on a small budget. Small, lo uh, what we would like really very, uh, as, as a sentence to, to, to get across is that small loans can lead to big tragedies because in fact, it's an accumulation of small loans that can lead people into over indebtedness. So we really need to protect the most vulnerable consumers against those is irresponsible lending. And we believe that the extended scope of the proposed directive is going certainly into the right direction. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, just as one, one person has raised it in the chat, of course, I mentioned both payday loans and buy now, pay later. Those are different, different uh, lending services, although um, you know, both separately uh, have been on the rise. Um, uh, and perhaps there are different policy instruments to, to, to tackle the, the two of them. Um, uh, but uh, we've, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, the extension of scope of this directive. Uh, we've heard also about the possibility of extending it further and having extra carve outs for green lending, which would certainly be something that's very politically popular at the moment. Um, but I just wondered, uh, do any of the panels feel there's a risk of some unintended consequences? Um, because I've heard uh, some people in the chat say, for example, it could stop people from uh, the popular arrangement where you buy your mobile phone via your phone bill, uh, which is effectively a form of credit. I've heard some people say it could even stop uh, invoicing arrangements where tradesmen um, demand payment for services after performing the services. Um, you know, is there a risk that this has gone too far in, in restricting um, kind of practices that, that, that might technically be credit, but that we regard as kind of normal part of the economy? Um, I, I'm going to ask that question first to Sebastian, because I see his hand is up and, and, and you know, he will give us all something to bounce off. Uh, thank you. Um... Thank you, Jack. Yes. Um, well, it's a bit of view indeed that, well, first of all, we were more in favor of extending the scope indeed to all type of lenders. It has been expanded partly indeed to, well, crowdfunding, but, but, but even P2P platform, et cetera, would, we would have liked to, um, to extend the scope to, to, to all of them and not only extend the scope, but also make sure that uh, those rules are enforced and, and those, those lenders are, are properly supervised. I think that was mentioned also by Maria Manuel. that's perhaps lacking. Um, now on the extension of scope to um, also the, the, I mean, below the threshold of 200 euro and other types of uh, credit facility, our view is indeed that, um, well, the, the risk is that those new forms of loans, which are indeed rather popular, uh, may, um, be much more difficult to 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 be offered, um, or at least if the the, the you know the, the the full requirements as they exist in the um, well the, the new text of a consumer credit directly have to be applied. So yes, we plead here for a, a, a more proportionate um, regime. Um, with um, you know a, a bit more indeed uh, well lighter lighter uh, touch in order to 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 be able to um, to, to 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 still uh, offer do, do, those products um, and and the risk we see is indeed if we do not do that uh, many of those products may not be offered anymore and and what will be the consequence uh, I mean consumers will will then go as it was for us partly the case before to to, to the non-regulated market um, so we need to we need um, to look at this uh, very very carefully in our, in our opinion thank you and and um, Maria Manuel I mean is that is that this risk of unintended consequences do you think that's overstated or is it you know is it something you want to look at as you examine this file You're okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all the suggestions after my intervention. Very, very, very interesting. Uh, of, uh, Olivia, we need to explore uh, these new technologies also to protect consumers and in order to uh, to can adapt the, the, the credit to uh, their capacity to pay. It's a very good idea. So uh, I believe um, the, ex the, the extension of the scope is the result of a, a great deal of studies 
that are included in the impact assessment uh, conducted by the Commission. Um, uh, I believe we can look at countries where rules have been uh, stricter for some years, and uh, Vinay uh, can, uh, can explain, uh, because Portugal is one of these countries, uh, for us, uh, uh, the law, uh, I think the law is 2009, the, uh, the Portuguese law covers all overdraft facilities, including uh, those below 200 euros, and this has not brought any negative consequences. So it's a very good experience, and uh, uh, we have a long exper experience uh, since uh, 2009. And um, since these products are problematic, something uh, we are certain after looking at significant evidence. So we need to be firm in the actions we take. The risk for the consumers is more important than abstract, abstract unintended consequences. So even in regulation, sometimes we need to risk some measures uh, in order to better protect uh, consumers. Okay, and so we, are doing so, awesome. we are doing so in different areas in the parliament. We are doing so digital service act, we are going to do so with product safety, with digital markets. We are experimenting new ways to intervene in new markets with new players. And we, we need to do the same with uh, this uh, uh, directive. Okay, uh, a DMA style approach and, and uh, some good experience from Portugal that, that, that will inform your, 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 your amendments. Uh, Olivier, uh, what, what's, what's your view on the, the, the potential consequences of these, um, positive or negative? Well, uh, to, be, to be honest, I don't really see uh, uh, a, a very big issue as regard the impact on potential uh, uh, re reduction of the, the access to, to this kind of product. I just think that maybe some change will, will occur because uh, maybe uh, sellers are going to, uh, to, to be obliged to professionalize this, this activity or to subcontract to professional this activity. Uh, and for example, uh, as regard then again, this idea of open banking, uh, which is very key. What is very important to understand here is that for people who are using such credits, it's already a signal that they do not have high, high, high level income, okay? So probably already the budget is quite, uh, let's say, un under, under pressure, okay? So these small credits are already, the use of these small credits are already a signal that, okay, uh, the situation is not that, uh, let's say, uh, uh, easy and, and we are not in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where households are very rich. Okay, so this is the first element. Then the credit for finance assessment should be made in particular for this situation. This is exactly where we need an appropriate credit for finance assessment. But as I mentioned already, because of open banking, because of new players on the market that can provide at the very efficient costs a, a very, uh, let's say, effective, rapid credit analysis of these kind of consumers, the, the supply of this credit, in my view, should not, uh, let's say, be limited. In, on the contrary, it might be a new opportunities for new players to develop an offer, but an offer that if the credit for financial assessment is properly made, will not increase the risk of over indebtedness for these potentially vulnerable or at risk, more at risk consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we've had one one question in from the floor already. And if any of our uh, our many viewers want to um, want to ask a question, please do so using the Q and A function. Um, but it's about uh, proportionality. Um, so, if the aim of the Consumer Credit Directive is to is encourage healthy, sustainable credit, um, is there scope for doing that via a risk based approach, where the questioner says, you know, the regulation will get stricter? Um, as the product becomes riskier to consumers, 
Um, is there is there more scope for for doing that in the regulation, um, uh, or, or or is the current balance already incorporate that feature? Uh, Nils, I, I saw your hand up. Perhaps perhaps it was on this question or the previous one that you wanted to intervene. Yeah, if you allow, uh, Jack, I would briefly come back to, to a few points raised before. Um, a very interesting and rich debate on the question whether the extension of the scope of the directive would um, impede the access of consumers to credits. Our analysis is like, like uh, Maria Manuel and, and I think also Olivier pointed to that uh, no, in a in, in couple of member states, the directive already applies to uh, more products. And we don't see that in those member states, there is a significant lower access of consumers to those credits. To the contrary, let's say the market is more regulated. Um, let's say you, you, you could say there is fairer competition and consumers uh, know about, let's say, the information and their rights. Therefore, um, this kind of link that by extending the scope, you come to a lower access, we cannot confirm. Of course, the question, uh, uh, can be asked, and this discussion is now starting in, in Council and Parliament, whether when you extend the scope, you should apply the full range of obligations or whether, whether you could uh, should come to some kind of proportionate application. That is, let's say, not an easy uh, question to think about because obviously, let's say, the, the um, obligations in terms of information, of right to withdrawal, um, and even then the, the caps, um, uh, they are uh, of course, meant to make sure that the consumer really gets all the relevant information. So how can you differentiate if you go below 200 euro? But it's a point which needs further um, reflection. Second point regarding the green loans. Obviously, we also have a lot of sympathy with green loans. And we thought long about it, whether we should include any proposal, uh, any provision in our proposal. At the moment, we decided against. Why? Because, um, let's say, the Consumer Credit Directive sets out the horizontal rules irrespective of what is the purpose for what you take the credit. Is it for improving the energy efficiency of your house? Is it to, to buy a product for, for your lifestyle? Is it uh, for, for, let's say, uh, a health intervention? Uh, so let's say it doesn't specify the purpose. And we were, let's say, coming at the moment to the conclusion that uh, while, of course, we have um, an interest to promote green loans, um, uh, you would not come to lower information requirements, you would not address the right to withdrawal, etc. And there's a lot of ongoing work by, by colleagues in, in, in FISMA and ECFIN on, let's say, green finance. And that's why for the time being, we have not included any provision in this proposal. But again, it's a point where, and uh, let's say we are very open to reflect, and there are additional comments also in the chat function, so let's say that's very important work we are reflecting on. The last comment from my side on the information overload, we totally agree there is an information overload. So the purpose must be to reduce the information that is pushed to consumers. And if there, uh, I think Sebastian said that there's the perception that the um, overview that we are going for, that we are proposing, adds on top of the information already available, then we have to, to uh, let's say, do it differently because the purpose is really to reduce the information. That must be the key purpose to make sure that the consumer gets as little information as possible, but as much as necessary uh, and avoid any kind of duplication. So again, very happy to, to reflect with colleagues in, in this direction. Okay, thank you. Um, I, that's very robust defense of, 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 of the, of the imp likely impact. Um, uh, one of the kind of cross-cutting themes I've heard from a lot of panelists uh, is, is about the impact of digital. And indeed, that's one of the themes of the, um, of the Commission's proposal. Uh, clearly, this is an, a sales channel and a marketing channel for, for lending, um, but it's also a tool that can be used um, via big data or artificial intelligence or social media data. Um, to 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 consider whether to grant loans, um, it, is there uh, is there enough done to capture the opportunities or the, indeed the risks of these digital channels, um, and to make sure you're safeguarding um, borrowers' privacy when you do so. And uh, I'd I'd like to first uh, ask that question to Olivier because I, I know that's a topic that you've. Oh, sorry, Monique, your hand is up. Happy to wait for my turn. Olivier, would you like to intervene first? No, please, Monique. I, I, actually, I was I was responding to a question, <laughs> and so I missed a bit of the question. Sorry, sorry for that. 
Well, in, in fact, I, I already mentioned uh, the, 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 the risk related to this data bulimia. So I don't want to come back to that. We, uh, I mean, we don't, uh, there is also a lack of data overload. We have an information load on the consumer side, and we have maybe also a data overload when it comes, um, for example, to credit worthiness assessment. But broader than that, we also believe that uh, the use of uh, profiling of you know, the use of personal data for advertising by tracking and profiling, uh, and then the personalization of offers uh, that can in fact exploit uh, the consumer's vulnerabilities because uh, you know, the, the provider or the advertiser knows you better than yourself. Uh, that is something that we would ask to be banned because we believe uh, this is too intrusive. Uh, it, it is beyond privacy. It is really exploiting the data. Uh, in, in, in a way uh, that uh, makes you as a consumer particularly vulnerable to the offer that is going to be presented to you, which might be totally uh, not, uh, let's say, um, uh, well, targeted at you, but would not be in your best interest. Yeah, so, so maybe if I just can react, just to say, so to, to, be, to be honest on this question, I'm absolutely fully aligned with, with Monique. Uh, uh, this, this approach is, is really the, the kind of doorstep lending. This is the equivalent of that. You're not prepared. You don't know what this person knows about you. You, you are doing other things and all of a sudden you receive something that can be extremely persuasive and you don't know why it is so persuasive. And, and of course, then again, it's going to, to harm the most vulnerable group of people because the others are more prepared to avoid these kind of, of, of uh, practices. Okay, thank you. And uh, sort of um, this stage in the discussion, I always think it's useful to tell, uh, to talk about monitoring and and you know how will we know if this has been a success um because there's lots of claims being made for 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 what the commission is proposing and, and what the final legislation might look like but um but how 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 can you measure whether this has had a positive impact um uh olivier i'm going to turn to you again well yes yes thank you uh on, on this element, I, I really do think that we have uh with this uh directive really a great, great opportunity to add into this, uh, this legal, let's say, uh, frame, um, some very important indicators of the quality of the credit market. These indicators should be made and based in a very easy and already, uh, let's say, available uh, data from creditors, uh, which is the, um, the kind of common typology on the consumer credit. And a, um, let's say uh, the default rates for each categories of consumer credit, and these uh, default rates can be something because these default rates speak about the dangerosity or risk appetite from from the the, the credit providers, and if one of the key objective of the directive is pre precisely to prevent overindebtedness and arrears and all these elements, it could be good that creditors provide on a regular basis these indicators to, to the regulator, to the supervisor. And so we can assess how these default rates evolve in the future. And we can also, if we add some particular, let's say, uh, um, rating factors, such as the selling channel that has been used, precisely digital, by phone or whatever, if we observe significant differences, and here it's about that. What, why these credit providers do have a, a default rate much higher than the average? Probably the business model has been designed to allow, uh, let's say, to make profit with a lot of people, a lot of clients that are defaulted or in arrears. And so, because the business model is, is designed on that, and payday lenders have developed such such product, and the papers have been uh, have been made available on that. So. Definitely, this is an opportunity to allow a proper assessment of the impact of a regulation. And I think as regard the better regulation, let's say, uh, ambition of the, the Commission, this is really a, the, the moment and the regulation to allow that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're approaching the last five minutes of our, of our event, but I, I see lots of hands raised in response to that uh, from, from Olivier on, on the importance of how you measure success. Uh, Maria Manuel, uh, would please please respond and then I'll like to turn to Sebastian. 
Uh, again, a, a small remark on enforcement. I know this is a directive. Maybe it should be a regulation. Uh, because, because enforcement is very important, and this enforcement is uh, our critical point for the, these uh, new proposals we are discussing in the Parliament. Again, is the problem with the SA, the MA, uh, and also a Consumer Credit Directive. If you want a very good regulation, you need a very good enforcement. And so we need a very good supervision, uh, empowered to do uh, their job. If not, we are going to discuss very good rules, but at the end of the day, uh, the rules are not going by themselves to change the, the, the behavior of the financial institutions and uh, empower, uh, better empower the, the consumers. And this is a very, it's why enforcement is a very critical point. I know this is a directive, but we need uh, to be flexible and also um, uh, maybe make some amendments on uh, this point of enforcement that is very important. Other critical point we are not going to discuss today is the algorithm's transparency. Uh, it's also a very critical point, not only for this case, but for uh, different, uh, different cases, but we need to, to find a solution, uh, a balanced solution between secrets and between transparency and rights of consumers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, I'll, I'll, I'll let you respond to the, the various issues that have been raised there. Yeah, I mean, Jack, you have the difficulties indeed to, to moderate this, this panel with many people. And um, actually, we, we could have taken even much more time to discuss all those important issues. So I wanted to react briefly on, on some of the nearest comments first on proportionality and, and, and the extension of scope. I think, I think really uh, that will help. We'll come with proposal on that. The information overload as well. Um, I think there, there may, may be possibilities perhaps to highlight further what is key in the SECI uh, and not to add an, an additional SECO or perhaps just to go to a SECO instead of a SECI. There, there, well, there, there might be possibilities there that we need to, to explore further. I wanted to react quickly also on the use of non-traditional source of, of, of data. Um, well, the social media, I know, I know it's, a, it's a very touchy uh, uh, issue. There, there was indeed the uh, EDPB um, uh, opinion recently. I think we need we, we still need to look at that in an in an open way. Um, I think there are a lot of studies also which have shown that using non-financial data can improve actually the, the credit worthiness assessment, especially also for those people who do not have yet any any uh, credit uh, history. No. It should always be with the consent. It should be uh, consumer centric, um, and of course, I agree also that all the principles, not, notably in the GDPR, GDPR, uh, should be should be respected, such as data minimization and, and proportionality. Um, and and what is even more important for us, if if indeed we uh, well limit and and, and the, the data um, to be used for for credit is that we have a level playing field because again we see a lot of non-banking actors for instance which have a much more extensive use of of of, of data and that creates an unlevel un playing field um, and then the, the question of enforcement is again uh, uh, very important of course supervision and enforcement because uh, those non banks leaders, some of them at least are not really properly supervised or um, subject to any enforcement. Well, I, I was a bit long again, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very comprehensive. And I, I saw Olivier uh, vigorously shaking his head there. Um, I'm first going to turn to Vinay, who I think ha has something to say. Yes, thanks, thanks Jack. Um, I mean, just, just to, to, to add a couple of points also on the Portuguese experience as well. Um, First of all, just just re responding to to something that was mentioned about Seco and uh, Sebastian mentioned that the information overload is a reality, uh, and we should understand that uh, some of the digital uh, documents, um, some of the paper envisaged documents, are not uh, readable uh, or at least not uh, usable uh, in the digital context. Let's say smartphones, uh, other devices, and this was also mentioned by by Niels, if I'm not mistaken. So, for example, the Seco instead of being a separate document, could be a first pager. Uh, and being a first pager uh, annexed to the SECI 
would then allow for the consumer to firstly read the main elements and then if he wishes to he would then scroll down in a device and read the re remainder of the document um, so that would not be a somewhat of a, an overload but basically a, a summary of the main conditions of the of the seco of the seki sorry um, regarding the Portuguese experience, uh, something that recently happened in Portugal uh, in two different areas um, and which are relevant for, for this debate. One is uh, abusive fees and charges. This is a subject that has been very dear uh, for DECO. Uh, we've been mentioning this in different fora where, where, where we are represented, not only nationally, but also uh, at the EU level. Um, and uh, last year, finally, after a, a strong uh, advocacy from our side and other members uh, of the Portuguese civil society, uh, the Portuguese government had to step in and actually eliminate uh, some abusive fees that were applied in the credit industry. Um, and this, for example, and this was a, a ridiculous case where credit providers charged a monthly fee just for processing the repayment, which was made in the account where the loan was uh, taken out. So it doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense. We followed this uh, case. And finally, the, the government had to step in because the market didn't correct itself. Um, and this type of abusive fees has been eliminated uh, by law. Um, so in our view, the CCD could also have somewhat gone further in allowing member states to at least give them uh, tools um, to identify abusive fees and charges and then eliminate them uh, from these uh, markets. And one point which was just um, mentioned initially about the data and the, the credit monies assessment, uh, which was the medical history, for example, and I think someone mentioned that uh, right at the beginning um, uh, about you know previous uh, situations of cancer that have been uh, over uh, now uh, cleared in the history. Even that has finally in Portugal been approved by the Parliament uh, and will be introduced. That there is a right to forget, let's say. Uh, uh, about this uh, uh, medical history. So, for example, uh, credit or insurance uh, products will now not be penalizing uh, individuals who had that track uh, in the past and have overcome that. So they have the right, let's say, to forget um, uh, this, uh, this situation. So I think it's also uh, an improvement that may be considered uh, uh, under this uh, debate. Thank you. Thank you. I can I can tell this is a debate uh, that that could go on for hours uh, and about you know the correct balance between using social media data, which some people have their concerns about using, uh, or, or sticking strictly to financial data. Um, I don't think we're going to resolve that issue today. I'm afraid, uh, but we certainly had a very thorough discussion of it, um, and I notice we're coming to the end of our time. Um, so I'd just like to kind of summarise the the many different uh, topics we we've. we've we've heard about today. Um, we've heard about tackling payday lending um, and, and ending uh, debt tragedies, um, about responding to a digital challenge and the economic consequences of COVID that has left many people looking for loans, um, carve out for green lending that could perhaps provide the opportunity for people to, 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 to have greener lifestyles, um, the unintended consequences of some of the existing regulation and perhaps the new regulation too, and, and the massive information overload that, that the, bo the borrower is, is given when they, they attempt to take it out alone. Um, and also some of the technical issues um, inherent in this um, regulation about how you define interest rate caps, exactly what costs you should take into account um, in order to stop exploitative practices, um, and how you enforce and supervise all this, whether that's um, EU or national and, and via what, what kind of tools uh, and what kind of uh, legislative instrument. Um, that is all giving um, Nils and Maria Manuel and everybody on this panel a huge amount to think about. Uh, it's certainly given me a huge amount to think about. Um, and uh, as I say, we won't resolve this question today. Uh, but we've at least asked some of the key questions, and I think um, I'd just like to thank every member of the panel and everyone who's sent in a question and everyone who's been listening and following this um, today and, and in the months of negotiation uh, and, and legislation that will we'll now follow. Thank you very much to all of those of you watching from home as well, um, and I hope to see you at the next event. Thank you, and I'll be available to receive all your suggestions. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah.